Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambhudasa Homage to the blessed, noble, and perfectly enlightened one. Homage to the blessed, noble, and perfectly enlightened one. Namo sadanto suchedo ye alahadi samya samputoshe. Namo sadanto suchedo ye alahadi samya samputoshe. Wu shang shen shen wei miao fa bai qian wan xie nan shao yu. Supreme and wondrous Dharma, subtle and profound, rarely is encountered, even in billions of eons. But now we see and hear it and accept it reverently. May we truly understand the Buddha's actual meaning. Venerable Master, Shri Fu Shangren, Goe Shi Xiong, Dajia, Amitofo, Venerable Master, and all friends, welcome to our Sutra Lecture today. My name is Hung Shur. Today is Sunday, May 15th, here in the Gold Coast of Queensland. It is Saturday the 14th, back in Queensland, Australia. And we are here to look into the Flower Garland Sutra and the chapter called the uh, Ascending to a Palace in the Suyama Heaven chapter. So we're just about to finish that chapter and, and we'll be launching into, uh, we'll reprise next week and launch into the, the praises, what happens once the Buddha arrives in the Suyama Heaven Palace. So that's what we're about. If that's what you've come to take part in, you are in the right place. Don't you move a dad burned inch, as they'd say back in Vermont. Hold on here. We're going to request spiritual presence next. Here we go. We uh, invite the Buddhas and the Bodhisattvas of the Flower Garland Assembly, wherever they might be throughout the ten directions and the three periods of time, as we say, uh, to draw near and to uh, bless all those who are here in this assembly today. Here we go. bit of pre-sutra protocol comes from the inspiration here in Australia of acknowledging country. We say that the Kombumeri people of the Ugambi language group practice their spiritual connections to land, to living beings, and to all creation in this location for thousands of years, and today we acknowledge them as the traditional custodians of this land. We acknowledge them with gratitude as we share this land today with sorrow for the costs of that sharing, and with hope that we can move to a place of justice and partnership together. We acknowledge their wisdom and their elders, past, present, and emerging, and acknowledge as well all First Nations people whose sovereignty was never ceded. That 
graceful, uh, humble gesture can be done probably um, everywhere around the planet where 20th and 21st century culture uh, just gobbled up every traditional view of heaven and earth and humanity. Um, had the experience of explaining a Buddhist perspective on Gaia, on uh, the fact that humanity is not in the center of the Buddhist way of describing heaven and earth and the appropriate place for people. Instead, the mind is in the center. And people are just one, humans are one strand of a larger web. We call it the ten dharma realms. And uh, I was explaining this at an interfaith gathering, and the uh, indigenous friends from Argentina, from the mountains of Argentina, all said, that's exactly like the way our shamans describe it, the way things are. They said, well, what else did your Buddha know? You know? So we didn't know you Buddhists were indigenous, were, were uh, pagan, native, you know, views of, of humanity, but that's indeed, that is the case. So, interesting, indeed. Let's move into our text. Here we go. Um, original sound is on. There we are. Now, um, we're going to come back to number five. Here we go. This is uh, the, the Flower Garland Sutra, indeed, the Huayan Jing. Japanese call it the Keigong Kyo. Sanskrit, it was called the Avatamsaka Sutra. We're in a chapter called Ascending to a Palace in the Suyama Heaven. Sheng Yemo Tian Gong Pin, Di Shi Jiu, number 19. And we're working on a provisional translation, um, which I apologize for not getting out to everybody. Um, this is, let's, uh, okay, now we know where we are. I'm going to pop that down for now. And yep, I acknowledge that I'm not showing my screen. That's what I should do. There we go. Um, bring that text back. There it is. Here we are. So this is the uh, this is the text, and it's a provisional translation, meaning a work in progress. Still. We'll be working on this for quite some time. Meanwhile, here it is in English. And what's going on is the Avatamsaka Sutra was spoken in different places, not just once. Um, they say chi chu jiu hui, seven places, nine times. The Buddha returned to two of those locations to, to finish, to, to complete the Avatamsaka material that he wanted to share. So um, the Suyama heaven, as we've explored, is the second, uh, the third, number three, among the six desire realm heavens. In the, we're one of the uh, Dharma realms, or the Dharma realm of humans, in the desire realm. The Buddha described there are three realms that make up the places where beings can inhabit and the desire realm is where the people are. And it's, it's up, the heavens are up. They're definitely not on, on our continent, on our planet. Um, but there are six levels of heavens, not one, which the a monotheistic story would have us believe. So if you go to the first level, you have the the heaven of the four kings, they protect the planet, they protect the earth and its inhabitants. You have the Triastrimsha, the 33 heaven, which is where, according to the Buddhist view of monotheistic the stories, that's where Lord God is. And his name is Chakra, also known as the Jade Emperor, Yu Huang Da Di. Then above that level is our heaven here, the Suyama heaven. Then we have the, the uh, uh, Tushita heaven, the heaven of bliss from transformation, and then the heaven of bliss from others' transformations. Then you're out of the desire realm. Mara can't get you. You're above 
you, you, there's no, you're never going to have to deal with a story like Job, you know, where Mara and, and God test their faithful disciple Job. That all happened in the desire realm. Once you're out of the desire realm, if you're still cultivating and ac accumulating blessings and heading up, you're in what's called the form realm, where the Brahma heaven gods live. They spend their day in dhyana samadhi, their, and that incredible uh, peace of mind and well-being in your body. Ooh, um, that's what those gods know. And there are many. There are 28 levels in the, this realm, and above that, there are only four. That's the formless realm. Then you're out of the three realms. You're into the realm of sages, you've entered nirvana in the various levels of nirvana, various kinds of samadhis. So that's, that's where we are. This is a, giving you the, the cook's tour, the thumbnail sketch of how the Buddha said the real estate is if you travel up. So desire realm, form realm, formless realm, and then you're into the arhats stages and to the realm of bodhisattvas and buddhas. So, also Pracheka Buddhas, I left them out. So that's, that's the story. Okay, where are we? We're in the Suyama heaven. What's going on? The Buddha's coming up. The Buddha's going to start to talk. And so the, the God in charge of the Suyama heaven saw him coming and said, oh boy, we got to get ready. So he prepared, he decorated a palace that he set aside for the Buddha to speak in. And our sutra, what we heard, is the decorations, what it was like, all the incredible uh, blessings that the devas have, the gods have, were put into effect to create this seat, this throne. And so uh, once the throne was ready, having arrayed the seat, the king bowed, put his palms together, said to the Buddha, welcome, welcome. Welcome, Buddha. So glad you have come here. Uh, we humbly wish that you will favor us and abide here and speak the Dharma. So, oh boy, guess what happened next? The Buddha said, I will, thank you, and accepted. The invitation sat on the throne, and this being the Avatamsaka Sutra, it says, everywhere throughout the universe, this happened in worlds of the ten directions just the same way. So there's always this uh, inter-reflection happening. You know the famous uh, demonstration of this state? The, the Chinese monk, Fa Zhang, uh, wanted to show the, the empress of China, Wu Zetian. Uh, he wanted to give her the experience of this Avatamsaka state of Chong Chong Wu Jin, right? they call it, inter-reflecting without end, in infinite inter-reflections and interpenetration. It's not just face-to-face, -face, it's through as well. And so what did he do? He uh, set up a, a place in the palace, suitable, I don't know if it was in the palace or in the monastery, but he, the empress was coming. She, she was a Buddhist and she was interested in what she could learn from this monk. And so he got a number of mirrors, and mirrors were really refined in the Tang Dynasty. And he uh, set up mirrors facing each other, and he arranged them, aligned them perfectly. And then he took a golden lion, a a, a, an example, a sample of a lion statue, a small, you know, lions that decorate. We've got them here on the campus. Uh, Lions that decorate the entrances to places. And this one was made of gold, suitable for the empress to see. And he set up lions with mirrors. And he brought the empress in and he said, and what do you see, your majesty? And she saw a line of lions going off into infinite space, right? They reflected and reflected and reflected and reflected and reflected back and back. And Master Fa Zhang said, in fact, this is the state of the mind when you integrate it with the Avatamsaka Dharma. This is the Buddha's description of how the original mind actually 
sees all phenomena. That everything is interpenetrating without obstruction because why? It's a reflection of the mind. Now, of course, if my mind is full of greed and anger and jealousy and delusion, the potential for that is still there, but the reality is kind of like mirrors have got a layer of crud over the mirror. You've swiped Vaseline all over the mirror, so you can't, it doesn't reflect the way it, it could if we cleaned off the Vaseline. So the emperor said, oh, I've never seen it so clearly. Omitofo, she said to Master Fazan, or words to that effect. All right. So, as it says, uh, everywhere in all directions, the same events transpired. So, yep, that's, you hear that, you know, this is the Avatamsaka Sutra. So, then a surprising thing happens, which is really interesting. We mentioned that this is, a, this is supposed to be the holy scripture of the Bodhisattva path, the, the Flower Garland Sutra, right? So, make no mistake, here is a deva speaking the Dharma. It's not the Buddha's voice. It's not Samatabhadra's voice. It's not Manjushri's voice. It's not Sudhana's voice or Maitreya's voice. Who is it? It's a god. It's the Suyama Heaven King who takes over the job of speaking Dharma. And we've got 10 verses that, he's, that he explains right here. And what does he say? This is really, I mean, when I was raised a Methodist, uh, it was the job of the pastor. Good, we had a wonderful series of Methodist pastors. My, they were always welcome in our home and were very good men and, and families. We knew them well. It was their job. It was the job of the mushi, right? Not a shanvu, but a mushi, a, a Protestant Methodist, to tell us what heaven was like. And I never got the feeling that it was an eyewitness view. I always got the feeling that the pastor was trying his best. He had his sources. He would, people would say, or we, you know, the prophet Ezekiel described this. But when we get to, the, to Buddhism, he's telling us what heaven is like, what, what goes on there word for word. And he describes the heavens exactly as he's seeing them through his vision. And so what is he saying? Here's the God saying, you know what? You're not the first Buddha that I've welcomed here. <laughs> I've welcomed 10 other Buddhas here in the past. And you assume there might be more, but he gives us 10 in a row. And he praises them. He's very respectful. He's very, you know, you can have a sense that this is a big deal for him, for sure. But it's so fascinating that the deva says to us, I've been around, and this is not my first Buddha Dharma rodeo, so to speak. He come, you know, welcome, welcome. You're one of a long line of Buddhas who have come to my palace to speak the Dharma. Please take your seat and speak. Interesting, right? that this detail, that the deva is an old hand at welcoming Buddhas into the, the palace of the Suyama heaven so that we can all hear the Abhatamsaka Dharma. All right, that's our background. That's what, where we are. We heard about the, the Buddha named Renown, Ming Cheng. We heard about the Buddha whose name was Jewel King, Bao Wang Fo, Bao Wang Wu Lai, right? We heard about Xi Mu, Rulai, joyful eyes or joyful vision could also be. We heard about, uh, was it Randang? What was it? Uh, yeah, Randang. Randang Rulai illuminates the world. We heard about him. And then we heard about the benefactor, Rao Yi, Rulai, who aids the world. And that was where we stopped. So we're going to pick up right here with. Shan Jue. Uh, let's see. Did we? I think we actually did do this one, I believe. Uh, okay. But in, no worries. We can start again in case. I think we did explain that, but I'll start here. We're going to do one. 
two, three, four, five. We'll do five. And that is the end of our chapter, but we'll save that for next week. Okay, are we ready? Here we go. And because these are verses, we're going to, do, we're going to chant them instead of just speak them. Here we go. Shanje rulai wu yo shi Zhu ji xiang zhong zui wu shang Yi zeng ru zi bao xiang dian Shi gu zi chu zui ji xiang The Tathagata skillfully awakened who had no teacher Supreme among what is auspicious has stayed in this palace of priceless fragrance. Therefore, this place is most auspicious. Therefore, this place is the lucky place among lucky places. And we did explain this before, but I think it's interesting that it specifies that he, he had, right? He was wu you shi. He had no teacher. What does it mean to say he had no teacher? It means if you, if you look at our Buddha's story and his birthday is being celebrated this month, um, you could also say that he had no teacher, strictly speaking. On the other hand, you'd be right if you said he had many teachers. So to, to be, you say, wu shi zi tong, somebody who wakes up on their own, uh-uh, that's not exactly the case. Um, they have instructions, but maybe they don't have, they have no, uh, they didn't study under the seat of some already established credible authority. They were uh, busy using teachings that they got picked up somewhere along the way. The story of Siddhartha, right, our prince, Prince Siddhartha is that he went off for six years into the mountains and applied himself to all the different teachers that he found and rejected many of them. I think that's such a fascinating bit of our founding story is that uh, as, as the, the six years of Siddhartha's uh, cultivation, his ascetic practices, his vigorous application to the Tao, that he ran into uh, a bunch of yogis in the woods who were doing things that later became known as wu yi ku hang, unbeneficial asceticism. Uh, they, there's a, they're part of the story. One of them is hanging upside down by your legs from a tree branch. That there are people who, you know, and you can see, you just hook your knees over the tree branch and hang upside down. And how long can you do that before your blood vessels in your head just swell and your brain swell? But there are people who would make the claim that that is the way to Bodhi. Another famous one is uh, sleeping on a bed of nails. And there, there are people to this day who sleep on beds of nails. Assuming that, uh, enduring this pain and uh, sacrificing your physical comfort for the sake of the path is going to get you to awakening. Well, the Buddha said, the prince at the time said, uh-uh, that ain't it either. And walking over coals, people do that, they do. And, and the, by enduring the pain of fire, somehow that's going to do it. Um, the, the one that is celebrated, the, the wrong path that is celebrated in, um, you say, in, in statuary, in sculpture, is the teacher or the group that was advocating ending desire by starving yourself. So somebody said to the prince, he said, oh, you know, the problem is desire. Desire is what keeps you turning on the wheel of rebirth, samsara, it's desire. And you know, foremost among those desires is probably the desire to procreate the species, to keep the species going. Sexual desire is the strongest one. So if you can end the sexual desire, that's the way to get enlightened. And so the Buddha, the prince said, oh, I'll try it. How do I end sexual desire? And he said, well, food, food is the number one thing. So just stop eating and you'll be okay. So the prince said, I'll try it. 
that must work. I do anything. I'm, I've been out here long enough. I'm tired of, of uh, having all these methods that don't work. So what did he do? He cut back his food to the point of eating one grain of rice and one sesame seed a day. That was the, this is how the, the traditional lore is told, tells the story. And you've seen the, the image, right? You've seen the, the, the patient immortal who is so skinny, you can see every single rib and you can see his veins going over his ribs and he just looks awful and scary. Well, the story goes that at the ultimate point, just before he starved himself to death, the prince had this awakening and he said, I will die of malnutrition and I won't wake up. I won't have understood the Tao. I won't have seen my mind. And at that point, and mind you, he was surrounded by three uh, of the original five uh, relatives who had gone out into the forest to support him. Two of them had left. They said, this is too bitter. This is no good. Uh, we're going to die and we're not going to wake up. We're, we're out of here. See you later. And they had left. There were three more who were cheering him on, saying, you know, we, we hope you succeed in your extreme asceticism. So at that point, the prince said, I, I can't even hold my head up when I meditate. I'm just too weak. I'm going to fall over. So this is not the way. This is an extreme. I have left the middle way behind. Chung Dao, the most important dharma, middle way, and balance between the extremes. And so at that point, he accepted some, the story says it was milk and rice, rice boiled in milk. And from a, a shepherdess, uh, someone who was a, a local dharma protector who might have been a deva, came down to keep the Buddha going. And he took that food and his strength returned and he started eating enough again of, of very plain tasting food. And he succeeded in his cultivation. And at that point, the other three said, huh, look at this wuss. He totally cashed in. We're out of here. We don't want to hang around with somebody who's, who is, uh, turns his back on his principles. So two of them left because he was too ascetic and three of them left because he wasn't ascetic enough. So when the Buddha finally woke up, after regaining the middle way, uh, he was alone under the tree on the riverbank. And uh, therefore this place is the most auspicious, right? So um, what I think is fascinating about that story, why I retold it here, was that our tradition celebrates turning back from a mistake. In our founding story, you can go wrong. But the point is to recognize it and to return to the path. If you, how many times have we picked up a dharma and gotten attached to something that feels good or run away from something that doesn't feel good uh, when it's actually beneficial? So, but in general, there's all kinds of, of uh, they say, teachings that do not favor enlightenment. Um, compared to a whole list of things that are zhu dao fa, dharmas that aid the way. Uh, Master Hua always praised uh, Tai Chi Chuan as, uh, Tai Chi Chuan as a, as a very beneficial practice. And staying away from wealth, not make, taking the vow of poverty was a beneficial practice. Um, and, you know, eating foods that don't excite the palate. Staying away from really spicy food, which is a hard one, boy. I know they're, it's amazing to watch uh, people come to the monastery for our Saturday lunch. And these are guys, you know, who are used to eating spicy food, hot food. And they come into the monastery and they get a bowl of pho, you know, Vietnamese vegetarian beef noodle soup. And they, take the first spoonful and their eyes look down the table for that bottle of red sauce. <laughs> you know, and they, there, 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 that's it. Because it just doesn't taste like it's supposed to taste when you take the, the peppers out of it. So it's really funny how we attach to senses. 
So, yeah. So, the, if not to say nothing wrong, and if you are someone who makes his living by selling hot sauce, and I have nothing bad to say about hot sauce, just to say that uh, when we, the, the beneficial ascetic practices that Master Hua recommended were the ones the Buddha recommended. They're called the Dutangas, which focus on clothes and food and comfort. And if we can get into those places where we, where our bodies feel really uh, happy and tweak them a little, that's beneficial asceticism. So, for example, mm, taking a little bit of the spice out of our diet and seeing if we can, can you possibly eat bland food? Ooh, it's hard, it doesn't taste like you're used to. And what's the benefit of that? You get to the place where you look at, you think food is really medicine. Hmm. Yeah, maybe I eat just the same way I gas up my car. Uh, if my car is meant to run on unleaded and I put leaded in, if it's meant to run on, on uh, regular and I put in high test or premium, you realize eh, some, not every thing that you put in the car is good for the car. Not everything you put in your body is good for your body. Maybe I can experiment. And to actually pull your, your tongue, your taste buds back a little bit so that ordinary food tastes good enough, that's really helpful because you, you come face to face with, well, what is it inside me that loves that flavor? Is that real? Is that me? Is that primary or is that just a constructed self? Let me explore the area where I can let go of that and I've got real energy for awareness, for mindfulness of how much of my life is just built on habit. Habits that please what? The eyes, the ears, the nose, the tongue, the body, and the mind. And if I can do without them, that self really kicks up a fuss. And if I can tell him, be patient, you know, not everybody likes hot food. Some people like sweet food. And if you take away the sugar, wow. If you put three spoonfuls of sugar in your coffee, cut it back, try black for a while, and just realize, blah, I am so attached to my habits. I talked about uh, our dear friend, our dear late friend David Rounds, who couldn't, he was ready to leave home except for toast and the toast and coffee in the New York Times in the morning. Without them, he, life wasn't worth living. <laughs> so, bless his heart. So, yeah, we get attached. Anyway, there's the Buddha. I'm off on a tangent here, but we have the, uh, uh, the Buddha in the forest learning about beneficial and unbeneficial asceticism. And our tradition has in its founding story this idea that you can make a mistake and recognize it and come back and continue. Even to the point if people break, if take the precepts, the moral precepts, and then break them, uh, if one is honest and can trace back the rising of the thoughts that pushed us, the, the fighting, the greed, the seeking, the selfishness, and the self-benefit, the, the dishonesty that pushed us to a broken precept, we can return from a, a moral error. If we couldn't, nobody would ever become a Buddha. You couldn't walk the path. So the, I really enjoy that generosity of spirit in the Mahayana that says, yeah, so recognize you did it, really get to the heart of the cause, watch your thoughts that led you into the action of broken precepts, and repair, it's called renewing, repenting, renewing, reforming. And then you're back on the path. If that weren't the case, then hell would be full of failed practitioners, right? Nobody would ever succeed in their cultivation. So, Shifu would say, ren fei sheng xian shu nang wu guo. He would say, people are not worthy sages to start with. Who is free of error? He would say, yi ding ke yi gai guo zong xin. You can change your mistakes and start over. He would always encourage us, try again, come back, try again. So, okay, there we go. 
Shrigu Sutu Zui Jisha, therefore this place is the most auspicious indeed. Uh, no teacher, you teach yourself once you get the Dharma. That's the way it's done. He stayed in this place of priceless fragrance, this Bao Xiang Dian, this place where uh, it smelled so good. Yeah, we talked about that last week. Okay, are we ready? And here we also uh, talked about the light of Asia last week, didn't we? It's coming up here. Sheng Tian, let's see. Sheng Tian Ru Lai Shi Zhong Deng Zhu Ji Xiang Zhong Zui Wu Shang Bi Cheng Ru Ci Miao Xiang Dian Shi Gu Ci Chu Zui Ji Xiang the Tathagata surpassing the gods, a lamp for the world, supreme among what is auspicious, has stayed in this palace of sublime fragrance. Therefore, this place is most auspicious. Let's look at the Chinese word for word. Here it is. We'll take you through the how we get to... They're welcome to come in. Okay, good. Um, Sheng Tian Rulai. This Buddha's name is going beyond heaven. Hmm. Surpassing the gods. How about that? Now, look, do we stop there? If we, uh, <laughs> I know there are friends in monotheistic traditions who would go, excuse me, excuse me, beyond God, who do you think you are? Just who, just let's hold on here. Let's look at that, right? So just that, Sheng Tian. So, in the Buddhist, in the Buddhist cosmology, um, the place of the devas is still among the mortals. Devas are still mortal. They can still die. And devas, plural, right? So, we have to, I was raised in a monotheistic world where there was one supreme being. And most Christians, most Jews, most Muslims uh, would certainly agree that that's the way the book, the Abrahamic faiths teach it. And it is a powerful story that is the most popular one in the world numerically, probably. But it is not the only story going. If you move yourself around the planet, we have this round planet, if you keep traveling, you can wind up in India and in Mother India, there are many faiths there who would affirm multiple devas. They would, were using deva as a, sans, a Sanskrit word from India. They would recommend that you don't cut yourself off from Vishnu or from Shiva or from Ram or from Brahma. There are so many different devas, the whole pantheons, they're called multi-theistic, polytheistic, right? So that's another story. It's a whole uh, spectrum of stories about beings other than human who live not apart from humans. They're still connected through our worship and through our study and through our, uh, our appreciation of them. But they are, uh, you never cross the gap from human to deva in, in those traditions either. You never become Brahma, you know, you never become Rama. Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna, Krishna. There's always those, they are devas, they're sub, sub, sublime, they surpass the realm of humans. But then we come to Buddhism. And what does Buddhism say? So see how we're sketching this. We've got monotheistic traditions, one only. We have polytheistic traditions. It's a different story told by humans that there are multiple supreme beings and you worship as is your choice um, among them. But then in Buddhism, it's, we call it non-theistic. It's not atheistic. Atheistic would say gods don't exist. Well, clearly that is not the case. Here is the Buddha talking about lots of devas. But in a non-theistic tradition, we say lots of devas, six in the desire realm, 28 in the form realm, four in the formless realm, but 
they are not given the same roles, the same authority, the same job of creating heaven and earth in seven days and humanity and all things. No, it's not that. Devas have their job, but they go through birth and death just like humans do. And they too have the potential to cross that barrier from human to enlightened being. That's the other part of the story, which I like so much, which is that if you apply yourself to the Dharma, you can leave being a Deva, you can leave being a human, you can become a Buddha or a Bodhisattva. You can become an Arhat or a Pracheka Buddha. So how amazing is that, that, that the, the gap between us down here and, the, and those supreme beings up there, you can cross it through cultivation. And so here we can learn about the devas. In this case, we are learning from a deva. These verses here that we just looked at, these are the words of a god. We're singing God's language here, right? And what is he saying? He's saying, oh, here's the Buddha. His name is going beyond the gods. <laughs> oh, hmm. Sheng Yan, beyond the gods, Tathagata. What a neat name for a Buddha, right? Gods plus. And you just, I, I know people, people in my very own family who would just crinkle. They're just going to, what do you, that's blasphemy. You can't talk like that. Well, the Buddha is not selling books. He's, he is telling you what he sees. You know. So beyond the devas, God plus, beyond God, Tathagata, is a shi zhong deng world amid lamp. He's a lamp amid, he's a the light of the world. Zhu qi xiang zhong, all lucky, lucky amid, most no nothing above. So most supreme, highest. So highest among all things that are lucky. Bi zeng ru zi. He, once in the past, came into this, above we had what? Bao xiang, uh, jewel, fragrance, the precious, valuable fragrance. Here it is, miao, xiang, wonderful fragrance. This miao right here, that's the word that the uh, Nichiren Buddhists like. Myo, myo, nam myo ho renge kyo. This is myo in Japanese, wonderful. Miao fa lian hua jing, the sutra of the wondrous dharma of the lotus flower. Miao fa lian hua jing. So this, is the, it, this appears in the title of the Lotus Sutra, that meow right there. So, okay, wondrous fragrance. This, and that's the name of the palace. He, in the past, entered this wondrous fragrance palace. Shi gu zi chu zui ji xiang. That is why this place is the most lucky, most auspicious. What do we do when we translate it? We say, the Tathagata surpassing the gods, a lamp for the world, supreme among what is auspicious, has stayed in this palace of sublime fragrance. That's why this place is the finest, lucky place. Yes, indeed. Want to see a lucky place? I got one for you. Look here. Uh, these might not come up in order. Let's see if I can get them in order. I'll, I'll set the stage for you first. I'll show you a lucky place. Okay. Um, last week we looked at Guoqing uh, Monastery on Tiantaishan in Zhejiang province, which has been there since the 6th century. And our host there, Master Yongguan, is, uh, is the abbot there. And... Uh, I described him as somebody, I, I, I'll save my comments. So, Master Yongguan, uh, we were there for several days and he took us around to the local affiliated temples. And one of them was called Wan Nian Si, 10,000 year monastery, way, 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 way up on the top of Tian Tai Shan. And it's uh, where the uh, Zhejiang Fo Shui Yuan or the Tiantai Fo Shui Yuan, the, the Buddhist Studies Academy is located. That's where all the students, all the young monks go up there to study. And it's 
it is a wonderful location for practice of the Dharma because uh, nobody likes to leave up there. I, I went in uh, 2013 and I went back six years later, the same teaching staff of young monks, almost to the monk, were still there teaching. They said, why would we leave? <laughs> this place is too good. So Master Yungguan took us up there. He took us to, I showed last week, the local Taoist temple. Uh, because why? The abbot of the local Taoist temple is another old timer. He arrived uh, at uh, Tiantai Shan pretty much the same time that Master Yungguan did. And they both had been to New York for interfaith gatherings. They'd both been to Shanghai, to Beijing, and around Taiwan for interfaith the Taoist representative representing Taoism and Master Yungguan, and they both decided enough. They wanted to stay on the mountain. It's just too good there. So we got to see. But then, so the story goes like this. Um, Master Yungguan knows that, that I'm a big fan of the, uh, of sharing the Mahayana teachings and so he said, oh, he said, uh, I got some place to show you. He took us to, here is Guo Qing Si right there. And he took us to a place called Zhi Zhe Ta Yuan. Zhi Zhe Ta Yuan right there. And where is this? Okay, that's the bird's eye view. There's not, uh, Google Maps doesn't do much with it because why? Um, because you can't get in there. There's no, it's too rugged. Let's go, uh, let's see, terrain, we don't want terrain. We want the street view. Let's see what happens with street view. Terrain, sorry, says no. Nope. Okay, uh, let's do the satellite, there we go. There it is, there. Okay, you can see it's Remote. This is a remote part of China. Where are we in China? We're there in China. To orient you, Ningbo is up here. Beijing is, there's Hangzhou up here. Beijing is way, way, way up here. We need to go smaller here. Okay, now we're talking. We still haven't found Beijing. There's Shi Jiazhuang. Ah, there's Beijing. Okay, you can see how far north Beijing is, right? Korea is right there. Here's Korea, South Korea. So we're back in down south here. You get a feeling of where, where we're talking, right? Jingdezhen, the famous pottery city there. Jinhua, okay. So... Coming in, zeroing in to Zhejiang, there it is, Tiantai County, right there. So here's the ocean. Uh, so you get a sense of it, right? Okay, that's where we're talking. Now, um, Master Yun Guan said, I want to show you a place. He said, I know you like to lecture. Let me take you to a place where the Tiantai teachings began. And we said, yeah. Let's go there. He said, there's a small place. It is not on the tour routes. Tourists don't get there. And he said, there's not much to see. You're okay with that, right? We want to see if you can show us where the Tiantai teachings began. So we got in the car and we're going zoom, 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 way up. The twisting, turning, and you can see those roads. And right? they were just really backcountry roads. And then he just pulled off. He just pulled off onto a turnout. And he said, we're here. What? We don't see anything. We got out of the car and we went walking back. And there was uh, anybody who has uh, been hiking in the mountains, you know what a trailhead is? A trailhead is where you park your car and start walking. So there was no uh, pilo, no, you know, uh, welcoming gate, there was no shanman, nothing like that. Uh, 
the, the mountain gates, as it usually is if it's a big temple. What was it? We started walking on big rocks. You just climb from this rock to this rock, up and up, and it was a staircase that had, if you just drove by it, you would not see it, and that's on purpose, I think. There's, it's meant to be hidden. And we came up and walked, and the trail, the, the foot trail twisted, and we came around, and here was this wall, Zhizhe Taiyuan, the stupa temple of great master Zhizhe, the wise one. He's also known as Zhi Yi. Uh, he's a sixth, dyna, sixth century monk, 525 they've dated him to. And uh, he was indeed the monk who founded what are known as the Tiantai teachings, Tiantai Jiao Guan, which are pretty much the first real statement of Chinese Buddhism saying we are not only looking back to India for the source of the teachings. We have had Indian Buddhism in China now for about 500 years, roughly, and it's time for us to adapt the Dharma to our local, to our Chinese way of seeing. So Christianity went through this experience with Thomas Aquinas where they reformulated the original Hebrew scriptures uh, to the new situation that they met in, in Christianity. Buddhism adapted the teachings of Indian Buddhism to China with Master Churja, the wise one. Very important watershed figure. He was a turning point. After him, things were different. So, okay, now, uh, this is what the, na the, uh, the landscape looks like up there, right? You really get a feeling that you are out in uh, a place that could inspire the Dharma. Just around this corner, there's been a big new uh, construction uh, since in the last six years. Uh, apparently, a bhikshuni has uh, been investing and got it all together to to rebuild uh, an old temple down in the valley there. Um, but that was a story for another time. We came up and here's what we found. This was the gate. And what did the stupa temple, the Ta Yuan of Master Jirja contain? It contained his Roshan, his flesh body. What is a flesh body? It's when he died, his body didn't decay. And this is, mind you, 1700 years ago. And it's still there. It's still there. It's, you don't, it's well preserved inside a stupa. So the other, the other week here in the Gold Coast, we installed Master Shrenhua's Sharira which were left after his cremation in our stupa here in Australia. But not a, they didn't burn Master Jirja's body, didn't cremate him. They put him in a container that allowed his body to slowly, slowly dry out, but it didn't decay. His, he was, all, he was, it's a, science has a hard time with these uh, whole shun, whole body relics. This is the, if you come in that gate, this is what you see. Um, when I showed these photos to uh, my uh, dissertation chairman, Dr. Nakasone, who we talked to last week, he said, Hung Shur, give me those photos. He said, I want to send those back to Japan. He said, I have never had the opportunity to go to, to Zhejiang, to Tiantai Shan, but he said, this is the Tendai teachings are just too important in Japan. They've never seen these. He said that, that you got to this place to take these pictures is really a blessing for you. So, um, okay, quite ancient, 1700-year-old temple. What do they say? You come in, 
and you see architecture like this. This is a hallway. You go down the steps and into the inner court. You can see the, just the way the architecture is built. This is classical Chinese temple architecture. Strong mortar built on layers, structures. This is how you build it if you want it to last 1,700 years. And mind you, uh, there have been uh, renovations over the years, but you go down that corridor and you come into this central area. You can see this, here's a wooden fish, there's a real fish, right? Donk, donk. You, that's a, a sound, that's a signaling device for the monks in the monastery. And periodic, there it is, periodically, um, monks will stay here, but they have to get permission from, from Guo Qing Si, from Master Yun Guan. Um, you have to be willing to put up with bitterness to stay here. It is not a comfortable, you know, uh, three-star accommodation. It's raw here. But uh, as Master Yun Guan told us, he said, uh, famous monks throughout the centuries have lived here, including Master Empty Cloud. Shui and Lao Hesheng explained a sutra here at one point. People came to listen. And I think Master Haidung also stayed here. And uh, quite marvelous. So um, if you go inside, uh, there, there's another gate. It got renamed by an emperor as Zhen Jue Jiang Si, True Awakening Lecture Temple. So this is the, if you go into this gateway, you see the Roshan, the, the stupa that holds the flesh body bodhisattva, the non-decaying body. I, I borrowed this picture from Baidu from the encyclopedia online. You see the steps? They've, they've been stepped on over 1,700 years <laughs> so by, by cloth shoes, shoes that have cloth bottoms, right? They're, and yet there's so many of them that they wear out the steps. You see the, the lions? Look at the lions. The greeting, they've been worn down by the, the weather. Zhen Jie Jiang Si, True Awakening Lecture Temple. Zhen Jing Xuan Du Liu Qian Da Qian Jie. The True Sutra is proclaimed throughout the entire universe. Jue Shi Hong Kai Bu Erman to awaken the world and extensively proclaim the non-dual dharma, the non-dual gate, the gate that is not two. So couplets are wonderful. Um, the, the encyclopedia also had this little detail from inside. Look at the way the architecture is made. With beautiful, this is the eaves. You can see the, the intricate carvings here. Modern architecture has really retreated from the vision of the artisans back then, right? Amazing. So, there we go. That is Jirja Ta Yuan, the uh, the wise one's stupa temple. Therefore, this place is the most auspicious. Um, we, uh, Master Yun Guan, uh, took me into the uh, the abbot's quarters, which is, you know, no heat, no water. You carry your water up there. Uh, I think there's a spring at certain times of the year, and you just, you know, it's it's bitter. But he took me through the the uh, the abbot's quarters to uh, a, a door and there's a little private garden outside the abbot's quarters and it's uh it was overgrown it hadn't been tended because th there was no abbot in this temple the abbot is down this is an affiliated temple of tentai of Guoqing monastery now but he 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 just stood there 
with a smile and he said, this is my idea of how it should be, he said, for a, a cultivating monk. And the paving, st the, the, the garden had walkways and it was, you know, 10 feet by four feet. It was tiny, but it was the perfect place, he said, to, to contemplate all of the universe, all of nature from this garden. And uh, it was overgrown, it hadn't been tended, but I could see it's how it could be simple, but lacking nothing to put you in the right frame of mind to cultivate the way. So just amazing. Dragons and their pearls, moss on the eaves, on the tiles, Chirja Tayan. So, there you go. That's why this place is the most auspicious. Place of sublime fragrance. Okay, moving on. Let's see, we got... Here we go. Wu Chi Ru Lai Lun Zhong Xiong Zhu Ji Xiang Zhong Zui Wu Shang Bi Zhang Ru Zi Pu Yan Dian Shi Gu Zi Chu Zui Ji Xiang The Tathagata never departing, heroic in discourse, supreme among what is auspicious, has stayed in this palace of all-encompassing vision. Therefore, this place is most auspicious. What is this Buddha's name? Bu Chu. He never goes anywhere. He's always here. And of course, he never comes either. He never comes, never goes. Rulai, he is the one who comes thus. He's just at one with all things. Interestingly, because his self, he, re, he got rid of the self that cuts us off from all things. It's not the case that all things and we are two, but we put stuff in the way, we cover over, we attach to stuff like hot sauce on our pho. Can't do without it. Oh, boy, oh boy. Putting, make, if you like sugar in your coffee, getting rid of the sugar. If you don't like, if you drink it black, add sugar realize ooh, how much we're attached. What about the Tathagata never departing? He was a great debater, heroic in discourse. Look at that. I think it's so interesting that the, the sutra points that out. That's the deal. That's what's important about this Buddha was he could really talk. And it's not the case to be heroic in discourse that you use a lot of words. It's just he, he used the right ones. <laughs> supreme among what is auspicious, has stayed in this palace of all-encompassing vision. Therefore, this place is the most auspicious. All right. So, uh, they, uh, <laughs> the old blues player said his uh, fans, the students used to say, uh, would say, would you teach us how to play the blues? And he'd say, I, I can't play. I just can't play more than a couple chords. And he'd say, yeah, but the ones you play are the right ones. <laughs> so you don't have to play a lot of chords as long as you play the right ones. So, yeah, being a, a hero in debate, man, oh, man, that was such an important issue for uh, India in the time of the Buddha. That was how... India at the time was just this uh, culture that was alive, alive with religious teachings. People were, their needs, their human needs were fulfilled. They didn't need better food. They didn't need better accommodations. Mind you, it, the, the castes were rigid. So we're talking about, in the Buddha's case, the Kshatriya caste. Uh, but even among the Brahmins, debate was the big deal. Oh my goodness, uh, I studied uh, classical Hebrew studies, Jewish studies, and in Jewish studies, among the great rabbis, oh man, you, your fame rose and fell on 
your skills in debate. And they would debate over everything. Just, you know, the, the old joke about how many angels can fit on the head of a pin. That is an actual case that came out of, out of the old rabbinic studies where they would argue, they would tell you how many. And then somebody would say, ah, but you've forgotten the perspective of Rabbi Hillel who told us, you know, oh no. And you did, they go, how more? He had many more angels than you ever had. Oh no. So that is the skill. And okay, I'm going to suggest that debate is a much more effective way of channeling testosterone than going to war. Why did India value debate so much? It's because if they didn't have debate as a way of s figuring out who was the top, the top gun, the heavy cat, they would have torn each other apart, probably. There were so many teachers, even as they say, uh, that the Buddha wakes up suddenly and he's there meditating beneath the Bodhi tree and he, for 21 days he walks around and says, I want to enter nirvana now. Well, those Brahma gods that we were talking about come down and say, please don't, please don't, please wait, please wait. There are many people who need your teaching. And the, new, the brand new Buddha said, mm, nobody's going to understand, it's too subtle. And they said, oh, you got to try it, you got to try it. Please don't forget your vows, living beings are suffering. So the Buddha said, okay. Well, he started walking and he walked to the Deer Wilds Park and he found all five of the former companions, two of whom left him because he was too bitter, three of whom left him because he wasn't, that he quit being bitter. There were the five of them and they looked at him and they said, something's different, Something, what's, what's different about him? He's not the same guy. And they were all related. They were related through marriage and through blood. They were his cousins and distant cousins. And they said, what's different? He's shining, he's glowing. What does he say? And they asked him for teachings. And the Buddha said, oh, very good. I'd be happy to speak the Dharma. And Ajnata Kaundinya woke up on the spot and then progressively the other four too. And from that time on, suddenly in Northeastern India, there was a new teacher. And it wasn't the case that there were all these loose disciples wandering around looking for teachers. They all were part of other communities. And suddenly, here's this new guy. And when he talks, there's, it resonates in your heart. And so they, they tell this, this really did happen, that a teacher, let's say a teacher from the Sankhya, uh, the everything exists school, uh, would, would wait, go to sleep at night surrounded by a hundred disciples. He would wake up in the morning by himself and all his hundred disciples were across the river under that tree surrounding this new guy, the, b -b 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 the Buddha, who is he? Gautama, Shakyamuni. And this, of course, a lot of teachers woke up unhappy because they lost their disciples. Who was the better debater? Ah, it was the prince, former prince, the new Buddha. And you know, it's that standard story that I've, about debate that I told actually last week because it, it figured into a verse in my praise of the Buddha. The Brahmin who gets really upset that he's lost all his disciples and he plans he's gonna out debate the Buddha. And so he, gonna, here comes his moment, here comes the Buddha leading his 1,500 disciples down the road. And, uh, and he stops him in the middle of the road and says, sir, we are going to debate. He said, are you a god? Thinking that this is gonna stop the Buddha. So the Buddha very happily says, no, no, I'm not a god. Well, 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 are you a demon then? No, I'm not a demon either. Well, 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 are you an avatar? Are you a prophet? And the Brahmin himself is getting all incensed now because he's lost all his followers. And the Buddha says, no, I'm not. Totally losing it, the Brahmin says, well, what are you? What are you? And the Buddha happily says, I'm awake. 
And the Brahmin goes to the end of the line and follows the Buddha. He adds one more to his following. He was the real uh, lion among debaters. And as we mentioned, Master, Xu, Master Xuanzang, the Tang Dynasty monk, not too far removed in time from Master Jirja, actually. They're both sixth century figures. Master Xuanzang was the chief debater of all of India. And it was not a joke. They, in the, uh, when they announced the king, Shiladitya, Jia uh, De Guowang, when the king, Shiladitya, announced that the, the Mahayana Deva, they called him, the Da Cheng Tianren, the Mahayana Deva had released his new essay, anybody who could out-debate it, anybody who could uh, best him in his principles, in his logic, in his reasoning, um, was welcome to try, but if they harmed him, they, he would cut off their heads. So it was life and death among debaters in India, not a joke. It was serious business. If you were the, you could lose all your disciples, you could also lose your life. If you took on somebody falsely or accused him falsely and couldn't back it up. So if you enter the debating arena, you'd better back it up with some ability to talk. You better have some debate skills. So interesting, huh, how this was, you know, and I'm, my point that this may have been uh, the way maybe we could learn something from this. And instead of pulling out a, a Glock or a nine millimeter and shooting at somebody who disses you, maybe we could learn to express our unhappiness, our aggression through debate instead of through lethal violence. I don't know. Anyway, just a thought. Let's do one more. Here we go. Ku hang wu lai li shi jian. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Did I, wu sheng, wu qi, wu sheng. Okay, we did that. Shan yan dian. Did we unsurpass? No, I've got, I missed one. Here we go. Wu sheng ru lai ju zhong de, zhu ji xiang zhong zui wu sheng. Yi zeng ru zi shan yan dian, shi gu zi zhu zui ji xiang. The Tathagata unsurpassed, replete with every virtue, supreme among what is auspicious, has stayed in this palace of wholesome adornments. Therefore, this place is most auspicious. Take a look at it. Wu Sheng, nobody beats him. Unbeatable, unsurpassed, champion. This, this isn't this, the Tathagata champion, who is complete Ju, full of Chong, the, the many virtues. He's got all the different kinds of virtue are full in him. Among all auspicious things, he is the highest. He in the past came to this Shan Yan Dian, this palace that is well adorned, that is beautifully arrayed, skillfully laid out. Shi Gu Zi Chu Zui Ji Sheng. Therefore, this place is the most auspicious. All right. Um, I was thinking as I was preparing this, um, we're talking uh, on one hand, we're talking about um, Buddhist architecture in a way, you might say. Uh, it's the place is auspicious, um, but that's the outer qualities. And why? This is a, a Deva king. This is a king among Devas, king of the Siyama heaven, who has prepared, he's cleaned his, his Suyama heaven palace. Um, he's created a place for the Buddha to speak Dharma and then decorated it to the max, to the utmost. Um, then he's telling us, you're not the first. I have seen 10 different Buddhas come here in the past and you are most welcome. You, we want you to be here. And I was wondering how do we, um, how do we imagine uh, 
you know, my job as the speaker, uh, as the designated uh, speaker of this text for this lecture, um, what I would love to do would be to give you the experience of this, of what it was like to be in the audience watching this happen, or to be even to be the Deva King, you know, to be welcoming the Buddha and then having the Buddha taking his seat while you're there with palms together telling him <laughs> he's not the first one. <laughs> there have been other Buddhas and how wonderful in this auspicious place, right? Wouldn't that be great if we could have that feeling? What was it like to, uh, to actually be there? And I was thinking about um, Master Hua, about Shifu bringing the Mahayana tradition to America and committing to it and telling us that we had a job. Our job as young American students was to help him translate the sutras and present them to our family and friends and our compatriots. That our job, we had an important part of his vows, which were to take the teachings that he gave us 90 minutes every night with the sutra open and then all day long embodying the Dharma. Our job was to take those teachings and translate them and interpret them for our culture, for our time. And where did we do that? We did that in an ancient temple in Chinatown, Tianho Miao, the first religious spot in Chinatown, San Francisco, Tianho Miao, which became Buddhist Lecture Hall. We did it in a converted mattress factory, a three-story red brick derelict mattress factory in the ghetto known as the Mission District, 15th Street, right across from the project, Gold Mountain Monastery. In Los Angeles's ghetto, 6th Street, where children walk to school carrying guns. We, I can verify that is the case. Uh, that was a church, a mission church that we took over, became Gold Wheel Monastery. Um, people have heard the term skid row, right? Skid row meaning where the down and out, the bums go. If, if you, you fall, fall, fall from polite society, and you fall down to skid row. That's kind of the, the bottom. There was a skid row, an actual skid row. It's in Seattle because Seattle is a major port. It's where the sailors, they'd get off their ships and start to drink and two weeks later find themselves on skid row. <laughs> there was a hotel for sale in, on skid row right next to the rehab dry out tank that became Gold Summit Monastery, uh, an amazing hotel. It was haunted. Oof, good grief. Then, ah, man, Vancouver. So we've got Los Angeles, we've got San Francisco, we've got uh, Chinatown, San Francisco, we've got, uh, we're going now up north into Canada to Vancouver, British Columbia, and the Salvation Army building. The Salvation Army finally gave up the ghost in, uh, on what was called the Queen's Highway in Vancouver, uh, Hastings and Gore, where the Vancouver Sun published a three-part series called The Battle for East Hastings, who was fighting the drug sellers and the drug users because there were too many dead bodies being pulled out of park benches and single room, single room occupancy hotel rooms, people ODing on drugs day after day after day. And they called it the battle for East Hastings because Vancouver City didn't want this blight. They tried to push the responsibility onto the province of British Columbia. British Columbia authorities said, this is actually a federal problem and gave it to the Canadian authorities who said, no, we, we don't want it. This is not our, our responsibility. That was where the Salvation Army building was. That was Gold Buddha Monastery. 
Uh, there was one of our many monasteries whom, that I, where I never went. I never went to New Orleans. Gold Dharma flooded out and was abandoned with Katrina. It was unlivable. So Gold Dharma never really took off. And then the Berkeley Buddhist Monastery, which is dead center downtown Berkeley, a church that had been there since 1898. Uh, and so we have... What is Buddhist temple architecture? Therefore, this place is the most auspicious, right? In, a, in North America, now in Australia, a temple, a mattress factory, multiple schools, multiple churches, a savings and loan, a hotel, a resort hotel, a YMCA, a Salvation Army, a bank, a theater, and here in Australia, a holistic healing center, which have been converted into Oh, I left out a, a, a hospital for the criminally insane, a city of 10,000 Buddhists. <laughs> I should put that on my list, a hospital. There we go. Yeah, so, therefore, this place is the most auspicious. What makes a place auspicious? It's not the buildings. I showed you Zhizhe Taiyuan. Last week, I showed you Guo Qingsi, Tiantai Monastery, Tiantai Shan, Tiantai Mountain. Those places, after 1,700 years, and hosting all those noble Sangha members, generation after generation, and still going with the Sui Dynasty plum tree, uh, still producing plums after 1,700 years. Um, so what makes it auspicious? And never mind the monastery, what makes your home auspicious among places? And I will suggest that you can't do better than generosity and kindness. We think about Master Jirja's stupa, monast stupa temple. We think about national celebration, Guoqing Monastery on Tiantaishan. Those places are famous, they're, but they're way out in the mountains. What about your apartment? What about your condo? What about where you're listening? your kitchen, how do you make it the most auspicious? I'm gonna suggest you can't do better than basic human kindness. And if a place is unhappy, if you've just, if, you know, uh, COVID has just taken you past your limits, if you've been trying to homeschool your kids, all of the, the crazy ways we've had to adapt in the last two and now moving into the third year, of a, of a global pandemic, the principle is still the same. Kindness, generosity, giving carries us through. And I have a wonderful song that I want to share before we end today. The story goes, I've, I've done this, I've told the story before, I think this year at one point, but it's really worth repeating. John Steinbeck, the American author and his book called Grapes of Wrath tells the story of the Dust Bowl era in the 30s in the US when thousands of families had to pick up and leave because there was a drought. And the dust was just John Steinbeck, right? The dust uh, covered everything. And what was used to be fertile farmland even a decade ago was now just dust, called the Dust Bowl. And so uh, people, many thousands of families, headed for California, a thousand miles away. And what did they have? They had only their rick, rich, rickety pickup trucks and cars piled high with mattresses and rocking chairs and grandma and they set out for California hoping for another chance. At least the land would grow crops in California. So there's this wonderful scene in The Grapes of Wrath where uh, a car pulls up somewhere in Kansas outside a cafe and the car is steaming from the radiator and 
a, a, a tired man gets out and asks, calls in to the waitress, can I put some water in my radiator? Sure, go ahead. And she says inside to her boss, she says, hope he doesn't steal the hose. And so there's, she's seen too many cars come by, you know, with the same story. The whole family is packed in the car. It's packed to the windows. And two skinny kids, probably brothers, they're only wearing overalls, no other clothes, just, you know, overalls with the straps. They come in with the father who wants to buy a loaf of bread for the family. That's all he can afford. And he's negotiating the price with the waitress and for a loaf of bread. And the two kids, like iron filings to a magnet, <laughs> stick to the candy display. What's the candy display? Well, you know, you remember. It's white porcelain with glass and there's a rotating tray inside with all the different colorful kinds of candy there. And there are lollipops and there are jellies and there's different kinds of gummy sweets and the red ones and green ones and blue ones and yellow ones and there's cashews dyed red and uh, the, no the cashew the, the pistachios are dyed red you know that dye used to get on your fingers the red pistachios and and the tray is rotating and the kids are just completely in samadhi watching this these candies and so uh, the old man the father says, and miss, he says, them candy sticks, how much are them? And she looks at the two kids, she looks at the, the, uh, the father, she says, well, she says, those red striped ones are, uh, how much have you got, she says. He says, got nothing but this penny. And he holds up a copper penny. She says, well, them's a two for a penny. <laughs> he hands her the penny and she reaches in and pulls out these two long hard you know candy sticks with the red stripes and hands them to the boys and Steinbeck is such a wonderful author that she, she says the boys are embarrassed at the attention on them but they're holding their breath for fear that somebody's going to take this dream is going to end that somebody's going to take them away from them and they put the, the sticks of candy behind their legs Father says, come on, get in the car, we gotta get moving. So the kids race into the car and they squirrel down and share it with their little sister, licking the candy. So the car pulls away and uh, there are two truck drivers drinking coffee on the table. And the truck drivers say, them twos, those ain't two for a penny, them's five cents for a penny. Them's five cent candies. And the waitress says, what's it to you? She says, <laughs> meaning, mind your own business, you know. And so the truck drivers say goodbye, go out the door, leave it. And the waitress goes over, she calls her boss, she says, Jim? She says, truck drivers left half a dollar, two half dollars. And uh, she says, too late to give them their change. So the, the boss says, so what's it to you? So wonderful story. Chris Christofferson turned that into a song. And it's a fantastic song about generosity and kindness. I like the idea of literature into music. Uh, sharing the screen, here we go. The scene was a small roadside cafe. The waitress was sweeping the floor. Two truck drivers drinking their coffee. Two okie kids by the door. How much are them candies? They ask her. How much have you got? She replied. We've only a penny between us. Them's two for a penny, 
she lied. Daylight grew heavy with thunder, with the smell of the rain on the wind. Ain't it just like a human? Here comes that rainbow again. One truck driver called to the waitress after the kids went outside. Them candies ain't two for a penny. So what's it to you, she replied. In silence they finished their coffee. They got up and nodded goodbye. She called, hey, you left too much money. So what's it to you, they replied. Daylight grew heavy with thunder. With the smell of the rain on the wind Ain't it just like a human Here comes that rainbow again the Daylight grew heavy with thunder With the smell of the rain on the wind Ain't it just like a human that rainbow again. Thank you to John Steinbeck for the story and Chris Christopherson for that song. Also, the subtlety that the daylight was heavy with thunder in the Dust Bowl, what they were hoping for was rain and couldn't get any for years and years. So, California. We may be heading into the next Dust Bowl. We don't know. All right. Uh, that will do it for today. And I'd like to, let's see now. Uh, the monks at the Berkeley Buddhist Monastery are up in Snow Mountain, Washington. Hello, Amitofo. Oh, he's there. He's listening in. Hey. Hi. Uh, you want to tell us what's going on? Uh, yeah. We actually have quite a lot. Okay. Where are you physically right now? I'm at Snow Mountain Monastery we go. with our master Hung Lai. All He's right. sharing with us his stories. Lovely. All right. Wish I could hear him myself. <laughs> All right. So here we are. Okay. So, so first we have, are you sharing your screen? I, oh, I'm not. Thanks for that. I don't see your screen. There it is. Okay, All great. Right. Okay, so first we have Buddha Root Farm, July 8th to the 17th, 2022. So this summer, for those who are missing the Guanyin session at CDTV or missing Buddha Root Farm, being out in nature, we're going to have an in-person retreat in the forest reciting Guanyin Bodhisattva's name. Very similar to the first Buddha Root Farm where people recited Amitabha Buddha's name. Right. So that'll be from Friday, July 8th to Sunday, July 17th. Please click the link below and you can uh, join in. I think there's still spaces, so please do so ASAP if you'd like to join us. Also, for those who really wish, you can also come a week early to do to work to kind of set up the place. Okay. So that's number one. Number two, um, the Guanyin great compassion mantra dedication of merit which we're doing every month now for probably almost two years is moved up a week may 22nd to 2022 so this this upcoming weekend next weekend i mean uh sunday morning uh, that's because to make room for our student center retreat which is happening the following weekend so please join in if you've been doing it um However, this weekend, we are having an Amitabha session, May 21st to 23rd, uh, three days. And we're going to be transmitting the eight precepts on Sunday, 8.30 to 10 a.m. Uh, and because Saturday, we're actually doing the Buddha's birthday 
from 6 30 to 7 30 and then we're just going to recite the buddha's name on uh on saturday and then on sunday we'll, pres- we'll transmit the eight precepts so, yeah um Ten thousand Buddha repentance, I think, is finished. So we're still opening the monastery for meditation. If you'd like to join on Thursdays and Fridays, um, it's a good way to kind of reconnect to your meditation practice, if you wish. I just mentioned this. This is our Shakyamuni Buddha's birthday ceremony, happening this, no, well, one week from now, Saturday, six thirty to seven thirty. We're doing the same format as we've done before, which is that people can actually register. Uh, to have your name read during the ceremony and we'll put your names up for at least 49 days on the on our buddha hall kind of highway wall and um it's a great chance to to practice with everyone and feel part of the community so it's some chinese instructions there as well and I think yeah. that's the main, mainly it. The Suna Center Retreat is coming up as already full. So okay. maybe you can join us next year. All right. Okay. Um, I was talking to uh, Cliff, one of our tireless volunteers, and he mentioned that friends in China are unable to get berkeleymonastery.org, unable to open it, and so they wouldn't be able to register. And we talked about it, and it's possible. He says any website designed by Weebly is not openable. So oh, really? Is our, is our website still? Yeah. I mean, yes. Just, yeah, that's why. If we were kind of like teasing our Chinese listeners, of which how many are online right now? 70. There's 70 friends listening to, uh, to Dr. Wong and to, to Cliff translating. And we're telling him, uh, where to go for this info, and then they can't open it. But it's not a question of censorship, it's a question of Weebly, somehow. So mm. the sooner we can use, switch to Squarespace or WordPress or whatever, we'll be able okay. to let our Chinese friends also... Can do. All right, word to the wise. Great. Okay, Amitofo. Amitofo, say hi to Dharmester Lai for me. All right. Okay, Amitofo. Amitofo. So we will now... Uh, transfer merit with our mantra that we're in the habit of doing recently. Um, it's kind of funny to transfer merit with a mantra, but the mantra is just a vehicle to carry our best wishes out. And because we're in a time of pandemic, uh, Medicine Buddha's mantra, this is the one that we do in the morning, every morning, part of the 10 small mantras. Namo Boche Fadi Bishasha, that one. And we have a Sanskrit version of it here, and we have a tune that we sing with it. So we use this as the transference of the energy and the merit from our sutra. So it's a really good thing to learn and to recite during the day if you're among folks who potentially could be carrying the virus to create good energy to keep everybody safer.
some Buddhas to bow to, to finish up. Welcome to join me here. And a second bow. And a third bow. Bow in respect to the Venerable Master. That's going to do it for us for today. Amitofo, see you all next week. Stay healthy.